Mark chapter number 9, and uh, we're going to get rolling here. We're going to go back into where we were, uh, verse 42, if you will. We'll read there. Um, really, I want to, I know it's, we, were, we weren't here last week because of the Bible conference, so we'll be back in here tonight. Next week, I want to look at a couple things here, because usually what happens in verse 42 to the end of the chapter and last time we were together, we went through it kind of in a very flow of thought-ish manner, if that ish is a word. And because what happens in 42 to 50 is everybody focuses in on that issue, verse 44, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Verse 46, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Verse 48, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And usually... By the way, you have to have a King James Bible. New Bibles leave those three verses out because they don't want to offend. And yet, really, what's, what, where everybody usually focuses in on those three verses, that is not what the passage is about really at all. And it, it, it's, th- those issues are really a secondary thing. Verse 42, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones, that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. And I don't want to miss the emphasis in verse 42 about the little ones and whosoever shall offend one of these little ones. Now, again, we have to get into our thinking where we're at and that flow of thought. So quickly, go back into chapter 8, verse 31. He just asked them, who do you guys think I am? Peter says, thou art the Christ. And he begins to teach them, that verse 831, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected. And uh, be rejected and uh, of the elders and of the chief priests and of the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And so he does that. And when he does that, then he goes into this issue then about they re- the response by the disciples is, is no. He rebukes them. In verse 34 and following, he talks to them about taking up, their, taking up the cross. Uh, they're going to have to... Uh, Follow him in the issue of rejection, in the issue of what's happening, what's going to be happening to him. They need to walk in that uh, rejection as well. That's why verse 33, he turns to them and says, When he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou uh, savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. They're not thinking right. They're thinking about being... Uh, uh, things of men, they're thinking about their flesh and that, rather than thinking about what's what's going to come and what they ought to be doing. So he takes Peter, James, and John up in chapter 9 now on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he shows them the kingdom glory. He, he demonstrates that he's the nobleman, goes off, receives the glory, the kingdom, and comes back. When he returns down the hill he finds the other disciples in trouble. They're not able to uh, heal. They're not able to take care of the nation of Israel. And in the picture, we see the young man here, the dad and the young boy, and, and that young man is in that total satanic captivity. Really, that issue there of, of the brutality of it, of, of them ripping on this kid, and beaten on him, and verse 19, he says, and oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? There, there's faithless here in, in what is transpiring. So the disciples, by the way, he delivers the young man and he, that's been held in that brutal captivity and restores him. And again, that's the picture here of Israel's condition in the end times they're leading into the second coming or the 70th week, the tribulation, him coming back and and restoring them and releasing them. So then the disciples naturally ask the question, why couldn't we do that? Why could we could heal and now we're not able to heal? Verse 
29, verse 28. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. And that issue of prayer and fasting, he brings that up because what's going on with them? They're not recognizing the progression of information that he's been revealing to them. He starts the section, the flow of thought starts with him revealing to them that he's got to go die and be buried and rise again the third day. They respond out of unbelief. They don't believe him. They, there's a, there's this, an issue there where they come in and they, they just don't continue in the doctrine. So he says to them about this kind, this issue of deep, dark, satanic captivity. That's the kind. That's only going to be dealt with by, then he makes a reference to the issue of prayer and fasting. And that issue of prayer and fasting, we went back into Matthew when we went through there and we looked how John's disciples come and there's the issue of the bridegroom with them. They don't pray and fast, but as soon as he's gone, then they are to pray and fast. Well, what did he just tell them? By the way, that bridegroom issue is a reference to the prophetic uh, picture there out of Jeremiah where he talks about them going into the tribulation and him leaving them. But what happens is, is when he's, he just taught them that he's going to be leaving them. And they don't respond properly, so they're not praying and fasting. They're out trying to continue as if the program was continuing along, and they couldn't get the job done. That's why, guys. Verse 30, and they departed thence and passed through Galilee. And verse 31, for he taught his disciples and said unto them, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men. I love that, is delivered. It's an already done thing. Just in the reality of the moment, it isn't quite there yet. But in the mind of the Lord, in the mind of the Father, it's a done deal. And again, he, he, he gives them that information about his death, burial, and resurrection. Verse 33. How do they respond? They don't respond. They respond with a big argument about who's first. Who, who's, who, now, I mean, you think about it. These guys are savoring the things of men, not the things of God. So what are they doing? They're looking at this going, well, if, if he just took Peter, James, and John, so they've got to be more important than us. And there's this great argument about who's going to be first. Again, they're still savoring the things of man. So the Lord, verse 35, and he sat down and called the twelve and saith unto them. If, he sits the little children down. You know, when you raise kids, you, every now and then you got to sit them down. You got to stop them. Boom. Get, get right eyeball to eyeball with them and have the come to meet in Jesus conversation. That's what he's doing here with them. He's sitting them down like children, like little ones. And what does he say? If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. If you want to be first, then what you need to do is become last. And you need to do that willingly. You need to willingly give yourself to be the servant of all. You guys aren't doing that. You're arguing, you're savoring the men. You're try, working in that flesh, and you need to get out of working in the flesh and come over here and work as who you are. So he introduces an illustration. Verse 36, and he took a child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receive me receiveth not me but him that sent me. So here's the progression. You see, the one, <laughs> you, you see this little child, if you receive him, he is the one that the father loved. Picture of Israel, the love of the father, Israel. So if you receive that child, the one the father loved, then, what are, and, then you're receiving me, 
and ultimately you're receiving the Father. So there's a progression here. By the way, you receive them in my name. So th there's a thought pattern here that th the Lord is trying to instill into the apostles, but he's, they're, they're not getting it. Well, John does. And that's what verse 38, 39, 40, and 41 is about. But when you do this, when, when you do the whole process here, and what the Lord's trying to get the apostles to understand is they're going to be his representatives in the nation, in the world, because where's he going? He's leaving. See? He, he's, hey, it's, it's like the Lord says, I'm the Father's representative because he sent me. I'm sending you, and you're now my representative, so let's grow up, boys. Okay? It's time to grow up. It's time to quit acting like little children. It's, you're trying to go, you, you got to move forward. So verse 42, and whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me. See, again, believe in me, receive in my name. So he's reaching back into verse 37. Now, by the way, verse 38, 39, and 40, and 41, John acknowledges something here. Hey, we're not at, we didn't exactly do what you said we were supposed to do here. But before we get into that, he, in verse 42, which is where we're kind of trying to pick up to, I wanted to get your thought process to there, and besides we missed last week, is he reaches back up to verse 37, and he's going to continue the illustration now in 42 to 50. Now, verse 50, look at salt is good, and if the salt have lost his saltiness, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourself, and have peace one with another. Now, that's the whole issue of the section. They are arguing with each other of who's going to be first. And he says, listen, you, if you, the, set, the whole of the passage here is you guys are savoring the things of men, not the things of God. You're not staying up with what God's word had said to you. You're out there operating, functioning in the flesh. And because of that, you're offending the little ones the ones you're supposed to be there for. And if you want to have peace amongst yourselves, then there's a process here, and that's literally what 42 down is going to be about because there's going to be some very serious things that are going to come against them. And what's going to happen here is, if you look at verse 42, and whose service shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, so again, back up to verse 37. Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receive me receiveth not me, but him that sent me. So again, Father, Son, you guys. There's that process. So he's, he has this ch child before them. Again, the picture here. Now, look back at verse 24. Because what does the dad of the little guy say? And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I, what? Believe. Help thou mine unbelief. The dad does what they Help, I believe you, but what? Help my unbelief. He recognizes that there was some stuff, there was actually a lot of stuff, that he doesn't understand yet. There's whole areas in his faith that was lacking. What's going on with the apostles? Same thing. He's given them information about his death, burial, and resurrection. They're not believing it. They're lacking. You know what they should have said? They should have said, wait a minute. <laughs> We're not, we don't get that. Explain it to us. But they didn't. So what do you have here? He, he, he's still a child, yet he's... The dad, he's trusting what he's been told. By the way, that's what a child does. Children very rarely ever question adults when they're told stuff. They start questioning adults when they get older, and that's usually because they figured out the adults have lied to them at some point. 
But if you, so what is that? Childlike trust, child, childlike faithfulness. They listen and they go with it. And again, the little children here, what are they doing? They're believing in him. And that's the one who they're to be looking out for. The one, and that's the ones that they are to honor and to teach and to grow, not to offend. Now, again, verse 38, John answered him saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followed not us, and we forbade him because he followed not us. So John clues in, well, wait a minute, you're saying all this, and we just did this because they didn't do what? Follow us. And John's recognizing that they haven't really been doing they haven't been following, they failed here to do what he's instructing them. So Jesus says, verse 39, forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil against. You know what, guys, you shouldn't have cast him out just because he's not with you. They were, they were making themselves the issue. And really, he what is the issue believing in him is the issue not believe not being with the 12 not hanging out with those guys not being in the same group you know it's it's interesting when you think about the body of christ sometimes we think well, there's all there is and if you're not with us then you you know you're just out but there's so many members of the body of christ that we have no idea about there's literally people when we, were on, when we met on baseline one night, one Wednesday night, we had a group of Indians, Native Americans, come in. And they understood right division, so I was talking to them. They, you know how they understood right division? They read their Bible. They got to read in their Bible, got to figure out. And it's like, and they knew nothing of who dad was. They, knew no, they didn't know John Verstegen. They didn't know. And I'm sitting there going, how do you not know us? You know, we're everywhere. <laughs> well, not in the realm of things, we're really not. That's why when Paul says, not known, but yet well known, <laughs> you know, why? Because you just kind of are there. So John recognizes what's going on. There's an issue here about them not, they were making the issue about being number one and not trusting in him and moving forward. So if you, by the way, if you look there at verse 39, they weren't recognizing the real issue, and that was Christ. But watch what the Lord, how the Lord says this. Forbid him out, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can, what? Lightly speak evil of me. Now, that is going to become the issue in 42 to 50. Because they belong to Christ, verse 40, For he that is not against us is on our part. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, see again, my name, because ye belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. So they do belong to Christ, and again, that's the issue. But come over to Matthew 7 with me, because there's an issue also here that is really what the rest of the chapter is about. And it, has, and it hangs on that word, lightly speak. Lightly speak evil of me. Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven... Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I have never, I never knew ye. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So let's think about that. It, it is possible to cast out devils, do wonderful works, prophesy in his name, and yet do what? Do it iniquity, <laughs> where he doesn't identify, doesn't recognize them, not being a part of the little flock. So 
that, so when you come back to 39, I'm, I'm sorry, Mark 9, 39, it's possible for you to do all that and still be a worker of iniquity. In other words, not being a part of the little flock, not being baptized of John's baptism and so forth, but yet you're out there doing it. And what does he say? That's why in 939, they're going to do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak, see that, that can lightly speak evil of me. They can't do that in my name, then go speak evil of me, and then go into the kingdom. There's going to, when you cast out devils in Christ's name, and you are a worker of iniquity, that's going to be a serious deal. There's going to be a serious consequence to that activity. And that's why he gets into verse 42 to 48 there about the serious consequences that come from that conduct of speaking evil of the Messiah and yet casting out all this and see, look, faking it till we can make it type of thing. And there's going to be a, a lot of people who are not Jew, believe they ought to be going into the kingdom, that aren't going into the kingdom because what they do? They spoke evil of it. And again, that's why he's going to get into the conditions here about the hellfire, and we're going to look at all that next time, all right? <laughs> I hope. Okay, that's the goal. So verse 42 here, they're going to... Sp- He's introducing the seriousness of those who are of the false fellowship. They're not of the real, true fellowship. They're out doing stuff in their flesh. They're doing it from the, <clears throat> from the savoring the things of men. They're offending the little ones, the little children, okay? The... the the guy, the, the, the children in verse 37, but in verse 42, who shall, uh, whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me. So this, there's seriousness here. Again, that's why he is going to introduce the issue there about hanging, being, hanging the millstone about his neck and jumping and being drowned. Then he's going to introduce the issue about entering into life maim, and so the hand, the foot, the eye, and all of that, okay? Now, the question then is, who's the little ones? Who are these guys? Who, do the, who does this represent? So, hold on to Mark, and go get Luke 12. Luke 12. Luke 12, verse 31. And just kind of notice here in Luke 12, verse 31 and 32, but look at, notice where we're at. Notice what's happening here. We're in the same kind of context as Mark 9, Luke 12, 31. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all those things shall be added unto you. Now, flip back to Mark 9 real fast. Mark 9, 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell. Okay? Verse 45. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter and halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell. Verse 47. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast. See how he went from life, life to kingdom of God? When, when they're, Where are they to have life? It's in the kingdom of God. Luke 12, 31 what are they to seek first? The kingdom of God. So if you seek first the kingdom of God, then you're not gonna you're not gonna want to have the offense of the eye, the hand, and the foot to be there. Because your 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 focus, their focus is entering what? The kingdom of God. So what are they to seek first? Well, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all those things shall be added unto you, the things above there of the Gentiles. Verse 32, fear not, who? Little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell all you have and so on. 
Someone asked me one time, why do you call these people little flock? Well, the Lord just called them little flock, okay? Believing remnant is another term, uh, righteous nation, foolish nation, holy nation. But the thing is, is that that's the prophetic title that they were to be fulfilled and called by, okay? Come back to Jeremiah 31, or I'm sorry, 23, Jeremiah 23, verse 1. Just see this, why they're called little flock in Luke, why the Lord calls them a little flock. He doesn't just make this stuff up out of thin air and, oh, it sounds like a, it sounds so cute. It's so adorable. You see my love, oh, my little flock. It isn't that at all. There's a reason for it. 23.1, woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Now, these are the ones who will get the kingdom, but what are they? They're scattered, the sheep, the pastors, the leaders. They are failing to do their job. Woe unto them. Okay? Verse 2. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my flock, ye have scattered my flock and driven them away. I have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries, whether I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. What's he doing? He's like, you guys, the leaders of Israel, you have scattered my flock. And These are the guys in Matthew 21. He says, I'm going to take the kingdom from you, and I'm going to give it to a, na a nation that's going to bring forth the fruit. You guys have failed. A remnant of my flock. That's who he's dealing with. Verse 4, and I will set up shepherds, notice it's plural, over them. There's the 12 apostles sitting on the 12 thrones, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. He's talking about take, gathering them up, establishing that government over the, the nation, and then going into the kingdom. So if you're not a part of that, what's going to happen to you? You're going to be left out. You're, you're, okay? But the leadership, the pastors, come on over to Ezekiel 36. What have they done? They've messed with, they've left him a little flock. Now, in Ezekiel 36, we have, you start down in verse 25, and down to 28, you've got the, the installation of the new covenant. And they're... The proper name is little. Again, over there he says we're few of many. So that's, he's going to institute the new covenant. Drop down to verse 37. 37. Ezekiel 36, 37. Thus saith the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. I will increase them with men like a flock. Now watch. As the holy flock, as the flock of Jerusalem in her solemn feasts, so shall the waste cities be filled with flocks of men, and they shall know that I am the Lord. See that holy flock? There's the little flock. Being, again, being set up, being set apart holy for the purpose for which he's, he's giving them the kingdom, but he's giving them the governmental rule of the kingdom. And he's setting them up, and he's moving them along. Come back to chapter 34, Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34. You'll see it here again. By the way, if you start in verse number 1, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? Verse 3, Ye eat the fat, and ye are clothed with wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. You think, see this flock mentality all through there. 
Now drop down to verse 23. And I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David. He shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken. What's he going to do? He's going to resurrect David, sit him on the throne. Verse 25, and I will make with them a covenant of peace. And will cause the evil beasts to cease out of the land, and they shall dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. And I will make them and the places round about my hill a blessing, and I will cause the shower to come down in the season. There shall be showers of blessings. We sing a song. So what do you got? You're in the kingdom. David is back on the throne. The twelve apostles are judging there. Verse 30. A long way to get to verse 30. Thus saith there... Uh, Thus shall they know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and that and that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the Lord God. And ye, my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men, and I am your God, saith the Lord God. Again, he's talking about the holy flock. He's talking about the believing remnant. And and in Christ's day, what's he doing? He's call. He's gathering together. What the prophets said are going to be a little flock of people, of believers. So he uses, come back to Mark 9, he uses that terminology. And when he uses that terminology and he calls them the little ones, Mark 9, 42, and the little children, but, uh, come over to John 13. Come on over to John 13. When he does that, he's not doing it just to do something and to say something poetic and, you know, you know, emotionally, you know, uh, warm, feely and all that stuff. He's using a prophetic name, a prophetic title to get them. He's going to take it. He's going to give it. He's going to take that kingdom away from those apostate nation. And he's going to give it to that believing remnant, the little flock. Look at John 13. Look at verse 33. Okay. 1333. Now, in John 13, he's in the upper room with the 12 apostles. Watch what he calls them. Little children. Yet a little while I am with you, ye shall seek me. And I, <clears throat> and as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, ye cannot come, so now I say to you. What does he call? He's talking to the leaders of the little flock, and what does he call them? Little children. So he's He's describing, the, he's, again, come back to Mark 9. The point in all this is that these guys, these apostles, these guys got to get over their flesh. They got to get over themselves. They're, they got to get beyond that savoring the things of men. They've got to come over here and... They, They've got to embrace the rejection that Christ, they got to pick up their cross. They got to follow him. They've got to embrace the rejection that's coming their way because who are they associated with? Him. Peter, three times. Oh, you are, your speech does. I don't, I don't know him. I was never there. No, you got the wrong guy. They don't embrace it. And if someone offends the little flock, the little ones, there's serious consequences for doing that. And it's, and it's not to be just ha, ha, ha and moved on from. It's, to be, it's extremely um, critical. It's serious. So verse 42, uh, Mark 9, 42. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. <laughs> Think about that. My grandpa, Jordan, he used to say, you ought to go take a long walk off a short pier. <laughs> okay? He also had a little thing that said on the coffee table, it said, in case of fire, open. So what do you do? You open it. It goes, not now, stupid, in case of fire. <laughs> okay? So that, thus you know where I get my humor from. It's better for you to just go out there and be drowned 
than to offend the little flock, the little one. It's better for you to go over there and just put a millstone about your neck and jump in than to offend those that believe in me. Verse 43, and if thy hand offend, see that, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life main than having two hands to go into hell and into the fire that never shall be quenched where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. He's going to begin to describe here the issue of hell, hell fire, as... The, and the consequence of offending one of the little ones, one of the children, one of the little flock. That's, that's the seriousness of this. That's that issue there about that can lightly speak. It's not a light thing to speak evil of. It's not a light thing to offend. Verse 45, and if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life, halt into life, than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. So you've got this issue here going on of the seriousness. Now, we're going to look at the... We're going to look at hell and all the things about it next time because the word hell here is that word is, is the Greek word, not Hades, but Gehenna. Okay? And we'll talk about, we'll talk, we'll get into that next time. But now watch verse 49 because here's, here's, where, he's, here's where he's leading them to. Because in 10 1, and he arose from thence and cometh in the coast of Judah by the far side of Jordan, and the people uh, resort unto him again, and he was wont, he taught them again, and the Pharisees came. See, he's going to, he's, it's moving on and educating them, and that, again, Mark just moving right along. So the point is in verse 49 and 50. Now, again, everybody focuses in on the hell thing, and we'll do that next time, but you have to see this. For every, verse 49, for everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourself, and have peace one with another. So there's a, there's a thing here now about the issue of salt. By the way, there's two issues in verse 50. One is the personal issue. You salt yourself. Salt, have salt, the end of verse, in 51 there, have salt in yourself. So now there's a personal, you need, there's a personal issue that you need to deal with, guys. By the way, what is it? You're savoring the things of men. You're arguing about who's number one. So we gotta, you gotta deal with your flesh. Get out of that mess and come on over here where you belong in Christ. And then the other thing is in a, in a corporate manner, having peace one with another. There, that where they're going to be peace is when they've dealt with that personal issue. You're not going to have the oneness that you guys need to be in until you deal with the personal pro, the that savoring the men's things of men that operating in the flesh. You guys are fighting over what's going on. So you got to settle. You got to get out of that. You got. Where are we going, guys? What are we doing? And you got to get in, get on with the program, is what he would say to them. So the personal issue, verse forty nine, for everyone. See that everyone. This is an individual issue here. Shall be salted with fire. Now again, you go read the commentaries, and you get a whole bunch of whoa, okay. One guy one time said that this is a very difficult passage, and he went right to 10.1. <laughs> and it was difficult to read a lot of his other stuff as well. But the thing is, is salt. The salt here is the fire. Everyone shall be salted with what? With fire. 
So salt is good in yourself, but salt, salt is defined as fire. Now the two, they have, they have a commonality in them. They both purify. Okay, they both fire. When you take steel, okay, and you put it through the fire, you temper it. It makes it strong, yet it also burns out the dross. So fire burns out the corruption, but yet it strengthens the uncontaminated elements. So fire, and by the way, salt does the same thing. Get, fire gets rid of the impurities, and yet it strengthens the things that don't perish. Salt does the same thing. Come over to Malachi 3. Just notice this issue here about the salt and the fire. Malachi, last book in the Old Testament, chapter 3. Malachi 3, verse 1. Malachi 3, now watch what's happening here. Malachi 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come into his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, we know the, we know the, the messenger, that is who? John the Baptist. Okay? Here's... Here, here, here is the announcer, Matthew 3, Mark 1, John the Baptist, okay? The, the, the one carrying the message, here comes the Lord. Now watch verse 2. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. No, see how the refiner's fire does both? It purifies, burns off the dross, and it refines and it leaves the purity. See that? It does both. If you come over to Matthew 3, notice how, it, Matthew, how John says it in Matthew 3. He's out in the wilderness crying, make way, here he comes, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. What's he going to do? He's going to purge the floor, isn't he? He's going to take the wheat into the kingdom, and he's going to burn up the chaff, but what, he's got fire going on here. So in Mark 9, when he says, every one is salted with fire, <laughs> there is a pur purifying process that the little flock needs to go through, i.e., 70th week of Daniel. Okay? He's going to pur purge out the, the rebel. He's going to get the dross out of them. So to be... To, to, be a member of the little flock, you had to be a believer in Christ, but also to be a member of the flock, you've got to go through the purifying process. So if you're out there savoring, go back to Mark 9, the things of men, you're in the wrong place. That's got to be purified away, see? That's going to keep, if you're out there operating in your flesh, guys, that's going to keep you back from being that holy, separated, distinct, specific nation that God has chosen them to be. Now, you have to think about this the way their program is. Don't think about it the way our program works. Okay? It's like that issue of justification. You can't think about Israel's 
salvation stuff like you think about ours. It doesn't work that way. They got a lot more stuff on the table. Same here. Individually, what are they going to have to do? They have to be separated, separate from that vain religious system. They're going to go through a what? They're going to go through a fire process. That's what he's getting at. It's better for you to just go out there and if you've offended one of the little flock, it's better for you to just end it than to do what? Get it, go through that fire. So there's an issue here about the fire and about hell that's, again, a lot of people focus in on it, and it, rightly so. It's not wrong to, but it's not what the passage is about. The passage is about verse 50. You guys are going to have peace amongst yourself. The only way to have peace is to get this flesh thing fixed. Get off of that. Quit thinking like men and flesh, and let's get over here and think the way God's thinking about it and what he's doing through you, the little flock, and let's get on with it. Okay? So when you think about this issue here, that's what's happening. They've got to go out there and they've got to get away from. They've got to get salted with fire. They've got to go through a process here of getting purged and purified and cleaned up. And that's coming to them. Now, in 43 to 48, that issue about hell. Okay? Again, it's, the Greek word here is for Gehenna. It's not hell as in Hades. Uh, there's, uh, hell has several different uh, Greek words and so forth that is used to describe what's going on. And I'm looking for a note, so hang on a second here. I thought I had it. Okay, so when you think about this issue, again, they make a very big deal about it being Gehenna and the garbage dump. But it's really more to it than that. Back in 1 Kings 11, Solomon goes out into the Valley of Topic and he causes Baal worship to be done as they are worshiping the god Moloch. And in that valley, they dedicate the babies through fire. Now, today, we call that dedicating the babies with baptism. That's why we don't do it. Okay, when they, you've seen the guys and they dedicate and they water baptize the babies. Well, that's, that's, the, de that's the same thing they were doing in... Moloch and Baal worship back there, except they were using fire instead of water, okay? So what happened is, is there's a, uh, <laughs> there, there's a whole thing, well, man, not to get into it. There's a whole thing there of Solomon doing that. So then when Josiah showed, he, he, Solomon sh established it. The babies were passed through the fire. And, and again, worship of the vain Baal system. But when Josiah came and he destroyed all that, he literally used that valley to dump all the ashes of all the destruction out there of the Baal worship. So when he would go in and burn down one of their temples, he would cause all that ash to be dumped out into this valley to cover it up. Now, today, probably if you go to Israel, that's literally a garbage dump, <laughs> you know, where they're, you know, they're dumping garbage. But it wasn't that way before. So it's, it's all of that ash, the ashes. And it's designed to demonstrate Israel's purification. So there's a spiritual significance to this. Far more than just saying, oh, it's the garbage dump. Okay? There's a prophetic connection. There's a meaning to it. But it has to do with the spiritual purification of the nation of Israel. And exact, that is exactly what the little flock is out there doing. They're to take all that religious stuff that, of, that the leadership was doing, that been, they've been captive by, that little boy, he's under captivity with it, and they're literally to take out, out there and to just burn it and do away with it. And that's what they're doing here. 
There, I, and out of that, what's the Lord doing? He's calling that little flock, that holy nation, and he says, if you offend one of these little guy, little ones, the little children, the little flock, it's you. And by the way, how they offend them is they take that little flock and they put them back under the bail system, the vain religious system. And that stops the spiritual purification of the nation. By the way, that's what the adversary wants done. If the little flock's job is to purify out the nation, and he can cause the nation to come in and stop that by bringing them back. Remember what the leadership did? You don't, uh, why don't they wash their hands before they eat? The pots and pans and all that stuff and the, the traditions of the elders, what are they doing? They're literally over there pu pulling that back. Then where do you end up? You end up in Gehenna is where you end up. You, Isaiah 30, Isaiah 33, Isaiah 34, Isaiah 66. Though, those, that's where he's at here in Mark. And that's what he's getting into. And that deliberate look back at it, that deliberate messing with, that deliberate destruction that's going to come upon the, the nation of Israel at the second coming of Christ. Literally, when the, when the Christ comes back, he's literally lighting all that on fire down there, and he's exposing all of that. And, they, and, and again, they're going to end up right where they're supposed to end up. And what the Lord's doing is you don't want that. What, what you want is you want, you, I, what you want is to take up your cross, don't get offended, don't offend, come over here and get with the program, okay? And every one of you, verse 49, every one of you is going to be salted with fire. No one who is a part of that apostate nation will get into the kingdom. Everyone here... Everyone has to be what? In the little flock. They've got to be a little one. They've got to be a little child. <laughs> They've got to be, they have to be believing in me, he says. You can't get there in your flesh. What is that apostate nation doing? Trying to get there in the flesh. Okay? So there's a lot, there's, there's more to going on. We'll get the hell figured out next time. Here, though, Look at verse 49, a couple things just quickly here before the end of the hour. Look at verse 49. For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. So if you come back to Leviticus chapter 2. Leviticus, every sacrifice in Israel's history is to be salted before being offered. Okay? Leviticus 2.13 And every oblation of thy meat offering shalt thou season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offerings. With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. So this issue of every sacrifice, come over to Numbers 18 is the issue here because it's part of the covenant stuff that they had that covenant relationship that they have with God. Uh, Numbers 18, verse 19. Numbers 18, 19. All the heave offerings of the holy things which the children of Israel offer unto the Lord have I given thee and thy sons and thy daughters with thee by a statute forever. How long is this going to last? It's, it's forever. It is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord unto thee and to thy seed with thee. So, and again, you can go to 2 Chronicles 13, go to 2 Kings 2. But when you come back to Mark 9, they had the, the covenant of, of, of salt, okay? In that covenant relationship, that's where they're going to find 950 peace amongst themselves where do they find it 
in the covenant relationship that they have and who they are in Christ. They, Acts 2, they become of one accord. Okay? Now, who's providing this oneness? Well, they couldn't come there of one accord on their own. They're arguing about it. So how, who gets them to peace? Well, Ezekiel 36, what, who, 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 what happens there in the New Covenant? He rips out the old heart, gives them a new heart, and he puts his who in him? Who? The, who's the comforter? The Spirit, the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit can't come until Christ is dead. John 8, he's dead, buried, resurrected, and glorified. Then the Holy Spirit can come. So where we're at in Mark, what's he just saying? Guys, if everything's... Catch the progression here, guys. See the thinking process here. See the progression. I'm telling you, I got to die and be buried and resurrect the third day. And when that happens, man, then, then the glories come and be glorified. Here comes the glory. We'll have peace amongst ourselves. But it can't happen... If we're over here operating in our flesh. So there's a little bit beneath the surface here than just going, oh, hellfire, worm dieth not. No, there's stuff going deeper here. And you, we need to catch that. Sometime take Mark 8:31 to 950 and just read for the flow of thought. And you see this progression through there. The whole progression is right there. The Father sent me. I'm sending you. You're going to represent me. I'm going to send you the Comforter. He's going to be there, but you represent. And you can't represent me in your flesh. You have to represent me in that covenant of salt that we have, that agreement we have. And that's where we're at. Now, next time, we'll go back in and look at Gehenna and hell and hellfire, you know, scare you to death. Better, rather to be scared, scared, uh, what is it? Uh, scared straight, scared straight than hell scorched or something like that. I can't remember. It doesn't matter. Tomfoolery anyway. Okay? So just catch what's happening here. It's more, I, I don't know, the preachers focus in on where the worm dieth not and the fire's not. And that's important. Don't get me wrong, but that's not the flow of, the, the reason all of that is there is because it's not a light thing to speak evil of him. It's not a light thing to offend the little flock. It's a serious thing. And the seriousness of it is going to end up getting you thrown, tossed over there into the garbage dump of the universe. Okay? All right. Very good. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the evening, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for everything that we have in your Son. In your name we pray. Amen.